Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Rooted to Truth. I'm your host, Mackenzie Dickinson, and for today's episode, we are going to be taking a look at the biblical origins of government, as well as the specific governmental system established here in the United States by our founding fathers. So without further ado, let's get started. What comes to mind when you hear the word government? Does it remind you of secular institutions thriving off of a drive for power and dominance? Or maybe even a domineering big brother figure pops into your head when you hear the word uttered? The word has adopted a negative connotation over time, and rightfully so, considering humans in their sinful nature have distorted and corrupted it. Simply put, government, at its origin, was a divinely established institution ordained by God. It has become ridden with humanistic motivations and has brought about great oppression when left unregulated, but governments maintained by God-fearing and able men are meant to be a blessing. In 1776, a nation founded on freedom and biblical principle was born. America's foundations have set her apart for generations. She is truly a gem that must be constantly cared for. Just like anything in life, if we are to appreciate and take care of what we have, we must first understand its value. So today, I want to kick off with a three-part series that will start from the beginning and analyze God's original intent for the government. Some of the main questions I want to focus on answering are, what purpose did government initially serve and what is so special about the form of government ordained to the United States of America? Most importantly, how do we preserve and pass down the blessing of liberty to the generations to come? Believe it or not, the very first form of governance was that of self-government. Now, I want to explain the term self-government in case my words get twisted or misinterpreted here. When I say self-government, I am referring to an intrinsic governing that does not require external restraints. If we take a look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, we find that God gave man dominion over all things, including himself. It says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The key word being every, for everything would include self as well. This mandate for self-governance is further established in Genesis 2, verses 16 to 17, where we find that God charged Adam with the ability to govern himself through the exercise of self-control and obedience. The text reads, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat you shall surely die. Despite possessing the gift of self-governance through direct dependence on God, man did not have the Holy Spirit, nor was God directly forcing his actions. He simply had the direct command of the Lord and the choice to either obey or deny said commandment. Therefore, he had no external or internal restraints preventing him from stepping outside of God's will. The only barrier between God, man, and sin was that of willful submission. Once man stepped outside of submission to God, well, we all know what happened from there. Man made the choice to disobey, and as a result, all of humanity lost its ability to live free from sin. Humanity surrendered its right to self-governance. 
And as a side note, what true love God exerts by allowing us to choose him. As a creator, he gave us free will so that we could choose him over all else. That is absolutely mind-blowing. But I digress. The boundaries for governing were originally limited to animal life, plant life, and self. After humanity's fall, the lack of governance and the predominance of sin caused society to boil over with chaos. God intervened, seeing what would happen if new governing boundaries were not established. In Genesis 6 verse 5, it states, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God decided to rid the earth of its corruption and sent a flood to do the job. But in his mercy, he allowed Noah and his family to pass through the flood. God saw that Noah had a just heart and therefore grace was extended to him. After the flood waters cleared and the land became inhabitable again, God established a new form of governance, and that being civil government. The first signs of civil government can be found in Genesis 9 verse 6, where God says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. This statement is pretty profound when you think about it because God is proclaiming the sanctity of life and furthermore is establishing a responsibility for civil governments to protect life, which is one of the main reasons for the government, to provide for the common defense and safeguard life. So in broader terms, the Lord is stating that bad behavior must be punished in order for society to function and flourish. Moreover, there's a fundamental need in every government system, and that is a moral foundation with which to be rooted to. It all goes back to truth. When a government is founded on a higher moral law that cannot be swayed by the whims of emotion, that government is surely to succeed. But when a government throws off morality and reverence of a higher authority, it will inevitably turn to another source for direction because God has made a place for himself in every heart. Scripture to support that claim can be found in Romans 1 verses 19 through 20, where it states, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. And in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, it states, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. So when the heart has a God-sized void, it is of the human nature to seek fulfillment by means of other sources. That is the most dangerous avenue to venture because it will lead to the establishment of self-serving culture and a tyrannical government. This type of scenario unfolded in Genesis 11 when the people of the land decided to build for themselves a great nation and tower that would reach to the heavens. It's honestly comical because the scripture says that the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. I can just imagine these people thinking they're all that, building some grandiose tower, and God literally had to come down in order to even see it. In order to prevent the one world government from forming in Babel, God confused all of their languages. The main point here is that men thought they could make a name for themselves, and everything would turn out just dandy. But the reality is their false governmental messiah could not save them. Later down the road of human history, after the Tower of Babel incident, God committed the law to Moses and gave guidelines for selecting leaders who could rule over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. That sounds a lot like the concept that we know today as a republic, doesn't it? 
That's because while the rest of the pagan nations had monarchies, God instituted a representative republic to his people with a ruling system based upon his word. The problem is, even though there were external laws in place to govern men, the law could not be written in man's heart, and the heart is the source for submission. A backsliding heart results in the manifestation of a backsliding government. Regression indicates a forgetfulness of foundations, which is something the Lord warned against. Through his word, God warns of the dangers in forgetting his commandments, lest we become enslaved by tyrannical governments. In fact, in Isaiah 30, we see a prime example of God warning people against this very thing. In verses 1 to 3, God speaks to a foolish Israel, saying, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel but not of me, and who devise plans but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. Now, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, the ability to self-govern was restored. As Jesus fulfilled the law and prophets, he accredited his righteousness to the accounts of those who would accept him and believe. Part of accepting him is allowing for the Holy Spirit to dwell within you and for the law to be written on the heart. Therefore, an internal liberation from sin can be made manifest through leadership and governmental institutions because it is the very Spirit of God that directs the actions of men in such cases. You might be asking, well, why is government necessary if the ability to self-govern has been restored? That's a valid question, and I'll tell you why. Government serves the purpose of securing and protecting life, liberty, and property. Not only is there strength in numbers, but there is also accountability and community that comes from groups of leadership. Even though the Holy Spirit has been entrusted to us, we still live in a sin-ridden world. And because of that, we have to have external forces to reward the good and punish the bad in society. That is why a government established using biblical principles as its foundation is blessed by the Lord. When a government seeks to be the beacon of light to its citizens, influencing and forcing by the way of righteousness, a society of integrity is surely to be produced. Of course, there are boundaries in which the state should not cross over into, especially when it pertains to that of family and church life. However, that is a discussion for another episode, but trust me, we will dive into the jurisdiction of church and state and all that fun stuff eventually. But going back to what I was saying, now that we have briefly explored the biblical history of government institutions, let's take a look at the governing system of the United States of America. There are many different forms of government in today's world. There are dictatorships, monarchies, oligarchies, democracies, and republics, just to name a few. Now, think back to all the different political speeches you have heard given in America during your lifetime. I'm sure if you're like me, you'll recall hearing the word democracy and republic used loosely and interchangeably. This, my friends, is another example of the dangerous and deceptive word game played in order to enforce rhetoric that agrees with the agenda. Why do they do this? It's because the word democracy directly implies a lack of greater authority. In a democracy, the people are the sovereigns, and their fluctuating emotions are the basis for policy and cultural change. They do not turn to a greater authority than themselves because in their eyes, they are the absolute authorities. A democracy is as enduring as a house built upon sand it will inevitably collapse by the weight of emotion. In fact, many of the founding fathers had quite a lot to say about democracies. Second U.S. President John Adams stated, Remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. 
There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. In schools today, they teach students that there is a direct democracy and a representative democracy, and that a representative democracy is what we know to be a republic. That is true, but where they go wrong is in teaching that the United States has a representative democracy, aka republic. That is simply incorrect. In a pure democracy, the representatives elected by the people are the sovereigns, and they aren't held accountable by any form of written agreement. What we have here in America is a constitutional republic. In a constitutional republic, the people elect representatives who are held accountable by a higher sovereign law. In our case, the higher written law is the Constitution of the United States, which was directly influenced by the Bible, might I add. It is through this form of government that statesmen can be elected as public servants rather than power-mad elitists. But do you see what they are doing? They are trying to replace the idea of a constitutional republic entirely because in a constitutional republic, emotions must filter through the word of God and are not just passively established as rule of law only to change once the people change their minds. Our founders warned of these things. Founding father Noah Webster wrote, Our citizens should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican principles is in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament or the Christian religion. The Founding Fathers had a fresh start when forming the United States government. They had the opportunity to establish whatever government system they wanted, and out of all the options, they chose the one with the greatest emphasis on individual freedom, the one which would certainly be blessed because it was built upon the Word of God. But, of course, a government intended to prosper a free people is not only a threat to the advancement of a globalized government. More than that, it's a threat to the demonic principalities of darkness longing to keep people bound to their sin and legalism. It is because our constitutional republic is under constant threat that we must be actively standing at her defense. A constitutional republic could not exist if not for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It takes a people led by the Spirit to institute a governing system where man is not the exalted one. In and of ourselves, we are not the sovereigns because it is truly the Lord who is sovereign over all, and he is leading us in the way that we administer justice and institute laws for governance. This type of ruling was never before possible outside of Christ dying on the cross. It took the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to allow for righteousness to be administered by the naturally unrighteous. So do you see what I mean when I say at its founding, the American nation is exceptionally valuable? The governing system granted to us not only has aided in protecting the temporal things of the individual's life, but it has also been conducive to exercising faith in the process. That being said, in the following two episodes, we will take a detailed look at internal and external liberty, as well as the stewardship we have as Americans. As sad as I am to say this, for today's discussion, I must bring it to an end here. I hope you learned a lot from this episode, but I also hope that you'll go and study these things more on your own in the near future. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to follow me on Instagram for updates and announcements. My Instagram username handle is at Mackenzie Dickinson, which I will include in the episode description. The next episode of Rooted to Truth will be released on February 28th. Please be sure to go and follow the podcast on whichever platform you're using so that you never miss an episode. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful week and God bless.